Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. Last week, spectroscopic principles observed in the laboratory were reviewed. In that video, we learned that spectroscopic lines can be used to gather information about the atom or ion involved in the transition, the electronic transitions taking place themselves, motion, temperature, pressure, electric field, and magnetic fields. The ideas have been extended in the sun with varying success. For instance, great advances were made when George Ellery Hale first applied the Zeeman effect to measure magnetic fields in sunspots, as was previously discussed. But not all applications of spectroscopy to the sun have yielded such valid results. In this video, it was noted that the use of the Saha equation is highly questionable in the solar atmosphere. The chromospheric lines are in emission, and therefore exothermic processes are taking place. But the Saha equation requires endothermic reactions. Again, Harold Ziering cautioned against the application of the Saha equation to the Sun. Now we need to gather further understanding of what might be happening in the solar atmosphere. In order to do this, we have to think about spectroscopic processes as manifested in the Sun. In the solar atmosphere, if the spectroscopic line under observation is sharp and displays an ideal line shape, it is likely that such a line is optically thin. Here is an example of sharp lines on the Sun. This spectrum was obtained using the Paris Observatory website linked below. When lines are optically thin, the photons involved in line creation can pass through the solar atmosphere essentially without being absorbed or scattered. Conversely, if the photons are easily absorbed or scattered, then the line is considered to be optically thick. Optically thick lines include the hydrogen alpha, calcium 2H and K lines, and the magnesium 2H and K lines. Each of these lines are very broad in the Fraunhofer and chromospheric spectra. I present examples of the calcium H line and the hydrogen alpha line. Again, these spectra were obtained from the Paris Observatory website linked below. Note the great number of narrow lines which are superimposed on the broad calcium H line. Now optically thick lines are complicated to analyze because the central core of the line is being produced at higher elevations in the chromosphere. Conversely, when we look at the wings of the line, they are produced at lower elevations. If you examine the hydrogen alpha line, for instance, you will note that its wings become extremely broad. You can think of the line as being made up of the sum of many separate lines each with a different line width, depending on the elevation of the solar atmosphere where the line is being produced. As one moves to lower elevations, the width of the line becomes broader and broader until it merges with the continuum. This is a sign of tremendous pressure near the surface of the sun. Now if an image of the sun is taken at the central frequencies of these optically thick lines, one obtains an image of the upper chromosphere. Here are examples of the hydrogen alpha, calcium and magnesium line. Conversely, if one captures an image in the wings, one will get closer to the level of the photosphere. Here is an image captured on the calcium 2H line at the core at 396.84 nanometers using the 1 meter Swedish Solar Telescope. Next, here is an image captured in the wing of this line at 396.47 nanometers. Now we see the granules on the photosphere. Finally, here is an image at 396.37 nanometers, and now the photosphere becomes even sharper. As a parallel, here is an image obtained in the wing of the sharp iron line at 630.2 nanometers. In this case, one penetrates the chromosphere and obtains an image which lies just above the photosphere. One can see that this is the case as the details of the granules are not as crisp as obtained when the sun is imaged not on the spectral line, but rather in the continuum as seen here. Now in the ultraviolet range, the lines are in emission as one can see in this spectrum obtained by the SOHO satellite. Because the continuum does not exist in the ultraviolet, there are no Fraunhofer lines in this region. Many of the lines in the ultraviolet are also optically thin. If one samples the sun at the central frequency of such lines, the intensity of the line will double when the limb of the sun is crossed. In fact, this provided a proof for a real solar surface as one can learn in this paper. Here is an image obtained in the ultraviolet at 171 angstroms in iron 9. This image shows the great increase in brightness as the limb of the sun is reached. The iron producing the line is thought to exist high in the solar atmosphere. 
So when we examine the sun at the frequency of a spectroscopic line, we have to deal with the fact that the line we observe can be formed at various heights in the solar atmosphere. Here is a figure displaying the formation heights of several principal lines above the photosphere. If the line is optically thin, it is difficult to establish the exact formation height as signal can be obtained from a wide spread of elevations along the line of sight. Solar physicists attempt to move the slit of observation further and further away from the limb in order to try and gain some understanding of the elevation at which an optically thin line is actually being formed. However, the line of sight always crosses many elevations despite the observation slit being placed with respect to the limb. As a result, one can detect intensity for a line often well beyond the height of formation listed. Here is an example of what one might expect in terms of line intensity as a function of distance above the limb. The line intensity will be variable and not simply fall off. Similar plots can be found in this paper. Again, contributions to the intensity at a given height above the limb are actually being made from atoms at a variety of heights above the photosphere. This is because when one visualizes the sun at the limb, we must also travel through a large part of the atmosphere, all representing different heights above the photosphere. Things are much simpler, of course, when the line is optically thick, because now the formation height of the line becomes clearer, and the resulting images obtained at the central frequency of such lines displays real structural elements in the chromosphere. All of this is related to what is known as optical depth of a line. Imagine if one scans along a line of atoms. Then the optical depth, tau, is given by the length of the line being scanned, L, the number of atoms in that line, N, and the absorbing cross-section for those atoms, sigma. The absorbing cross-section for atoms can vary substantially with the wavelength and the nature of the atom. As a result, optical depth in astrophysics varies with wavelength. Usually, it is always expressed with a small subscript nu, reflecting that it is frequency dependent. Optically thick lines have large optical depth values, whereas thin lines have lower values. Optically thick lines are saturated, that means that they will not have an ideal line shape. Their line width might no longer increase as expected with density, as one can learn in this paper. Now, the entire subject of optical depth brings us to an interesting fact. In the standard model, the surface of the sun is defined using optical depth. As a result, one gets a surface at different radii depending on the frequency of observation. For instance, in this text, the photosphere is defined with an optical depth of 1 in the green region of the spectrum, namely at 500 nanometers. More commonly, it is defined at an optical depth of 2 thirds in the same wavelength. In any event, since solar physicists deny that the surface of the sun is real, they have to define the position of the photosphere using equations. For each wavelength, that position will vary. This is a prime example of mathematics usurping observation. The sun has a real surface, as observed at every frequency, from the audio all the way up to the x-ray, as we saw in these videos. It is not an optical illusion. This is one of the key failures of the standard model of the sun. Well, that is all for now. In the next video, we will discuss stark analysis and why it cannot be used to obtain electron densities in the solar atmosphere. In the meantime, if you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on our next video.